Cool. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, thanks for the intro. Uh, my name is Reiji, and like I said, uh, I work at Depsheet, which is a company that does a lot of open source work on cloud native geospatial. And in particular, my work revolves around um, pushing, uh, building out the next generation tools for uh, machine learning on, with geospatial data. So uh, if you want to follow along, the slides are under that link there. Uh, and also share it at the end of the talk. So don't worry if you uh, can take a photo on, at, on time. Cool. Oh. Right, uh, so for this talk, I'll be uh, focusing on mainly three things. Uh, so building out the next generation of machine learning tools. Uh, so we've heard a lot of about cloud native geospatial at this conference already, but uh, what I'd like to introduce as well as uh, also shifting the compute from like a CPU native workflow to more of a GPU native workflow. So GPUs are graphical processing units. These are uh, processors that can really scale to um, a lot of parallel tasks at once. So it's really good for doing a lot of heavy computation on like uh, high, high, dimension, high dimensional data. So that's one of the things. Secondly, uh, because we're in this age of big data, uh, there's almost, so traditionally with machine learning, uh, we've been doing a lot of pre-processing, saving subsets, subsets, or we, sometimes we call them like chips or tiles of um, our raster data in intermediate files and then feeding those into our model. Uh, but with lots of data coming out, for example, NYSERDA is gonna be launching hopefully this year and they'll spit up uh, a lot of SAR data into the world. So uh, it might not be feasible anymore to store a lot of these intermediate files. So th there should be like a shift towards more of like a streaming model. So doing the pre-processing on the fly and just like, yeah, saving a lot of this space basically. And also the third point is uh, moving from single sensor. So not just like looking at, for example, optical imagery, but combining optical imagery with SAR imagery, maybe with point clouds, uh, increasingly with text data, voice data, all of these things. So moving towards like the multimodal world. So these are some of the three things that um, the Pangeo community is hoping to um, build out tools for mm, right now. And oops. for those of you who don't know, who or what Pangeo is. Uh, basically, it's a community of big data geoscientists. Uh, one of the goals of Pangeo is to promote open, reproducible, and scalable ways of doing ocean, atmospheric, climate, and land science. So just science, geosciences. Uh, some of the things we're passionate about uh, are cloud HPC infrastructure. So moving from like siloed local desktops, doing a compute on site yourself to um, share compute environments, shared data infrastructure on the um, cloud servers. Of course, uh, open source software, this is why we're here. Uh, so a lot of the Pangeo community uh, collaborates on scientific libraries. Um, X-Ray is one of the big ones, uh, but also they're doing stuff on cloud native standards, such as spatial temporal asset catalogs or stack. And lastly, there's also like an education outreach component so, uh, which is why, kind of why I'm here. <laughs> we attend like conferences, um, do workshops, do a lot of tutorials, um, and every week there's this Penjo showcase webinar on Zoom, which you can uh, go and attend. Or there's also like a YouTube channel with all of the past webinars, which you can look through. And those has have um, sometimes like pretty fancy new stuff that's coming out or like in development. So I do encourage you to check that out if you're keen. Uh, so that's kind of like the people side of Pangeo. Uh, well, I guess on the technical level, like what does the Pangeo ML stack look like? So if maybe some of you have heard about like the SciPy stack or the PyData stack, uh, I'll focus on one subset of the Pangeo stack specific to machine learning. Uh, it we try to be like kind of framework agnostic, so either PyTorch or TensorFlow, doesn't really matter. Uh, it is mostly Python based. <laughs> There's a bias to that. But yeah, so this is one of the illustrations 
I've kind of drawn them out to uh, highlight some of the key parts of the Pangeo ML ecosystem. So there's like kind of three layers to this. Uh, on the bottom row, there are the cloud optimized file formats. So Leo um, had a good overview of like what some of like Zar from Zar to Parquet, like some of these things before. So these are like uh, file formats where you can access specific chunks or subsets of the data without reading the whole file. So that's the bottom layer. From these file formats, uh, you would read the data from this into an in-memory array representation. If you're using uh, Python, NumPy is one of those libraries that are just like pretty much essential or core to the scientific uh, computing ecosystem. Uh, so moving sort of to the middle right, so, but NumPy is like just any, just numbers, right? Uh, we're spatial people. We want to work with spatial data. So Joe Pandas, you know, wraps around some of the, num uh, so it's backed by NumPy arrays, but you can read, you know, your GeoJSON files, um, shape files, all sorts of like vector file formats for that. And uh, QSpatial, which is part of the Rapids uh, in purple, is part of these like Rapids AI ecosystem libraries where you can do uh, your computation not just on the CPU, but on the GPU. So for example, QSpatial has a GPU-based um, pointing polygon algorithm that can run pretty much like an order of magnitude faster than standard CPU-based um, pointing polygon operations. And then there's some, um, those are like for vector data. And then for raster data, there's rear X-ray, stack stack, if you're looking at stack catalogs. And then shifting towards the left side of the middle row. Uh, so there's the CPU-based NumPy arrays. On the other extreme are GPU-based um, QPy arrays. These are have similar syntax to NumPy, but they're running on the GPU. So you can run your array computations on the GPU. And of course, there's um, GPU libraries like PyTorch, um, TensorFlow, JAX. These are all GPU, uh, tend to be like GPU-based array libraries as well. And there are some like in the middle, like Data Shader or X-Array. They can be backed by either CPU or GPU-based arrays. Um, they don't really care what's under the hood, but they can still do the run the their algorithms on top as well. And X-Array is just um, arrays with metadata, essentially. Uh, moving on to the top row, this is where the rest of the talk would kind of focus on. We have like the Pangeo ML libraries on the top left. There's some um, Kivik IO or Quick IO, QPy X-Ray, Xbatcher, Centrigeo. These are all um, talk about these in detail later, and then there's like educational resources I'll point you to as well. Okay, uh, to sort of, for the rest of the talk, I'll walk you through this like, example of uh, working with some of these pack, um, ML libraries. So I'll use an example of a climate weather data set called Weather Bench 2. Uh, this is uh, specifically the ERA5 data set. This is a climate reanalysis product uh, at hourly resolution going back for quite a few decades. So I'll demonstrate how we can read from this ZAR. Uh, this, this data set is stored in the ZAR store. So how we can read from ZAR directly to the GPU using a library called uh, QuickIO. Uh, how we can subset on the fly um, out of this big data cube uh, using a library called XBatcher. And how to kind of chain these operations together using a library uh, called Centrigio, which allows us to create these um, composable data pipelines. So a lot of like complicated data pipelines for custom um, machine learning pipelines. And to start, uh, we'll be reading the file from the ZAR store. So I'd like to introduce you to this uh, technology called NVIDIA GPU Direct Storage. Uh, what this does is uh, imagine you have your file there's a ZAR store on your disk, the sort of black um, cylinder in the middle, the NVMe storage. Uh, typically, when you're reading data from disk to a GPU, it would actually go through this PI, it would go through a PCIe switch and then into your CPU RAM, so the green rectangle on the top left. And then it goes through this thing called a bounce buffer, uh, and then it has to go back to the PCIe switch, and then before, and then it can go to the GPU. So there's quite a few steps here, and there's a lot, put, a lot of potential to introduce latency if any you know, of the connections are slow. Uh, with GPU direct storage, GDS, uh, 
you would go from storage directly to your PCIe switch, and then the data would go directly into your GPU. So less latency involved. Uh, but of course, there's caveats to this. This technology is somewhat new. Um, this, it only supports certain file systems, certain file formats via uh, QFile. So ZAR is supported via uh, QuickIO and Parquet as well via QDF. But uh, for GeoTIFF, Flat GeoBuff, some other vector file formats, those aren't supported yet. Uh, someone has to like code up the, you know, the code for that. <laughs> And for Zara in particular, if you, uh, it works best if you have not com um, if you don't have compressed data. If you have compressed data, there is support via uh, NVConf, so NVIDIA's um, compression library, to for LZ4, uh, Snappy, Deflate, like STD now, but uh, it's a bit more work to do. But it's it is possible to decompress your data on the GPU instead of using the CPU. So sort of working towards that GPU native. Uh, world where you can do everything on the GPU. And that's this blog post if you, you're interested in finding out more. So once we have our data kind of read, uh, but actually we don't want to read all of our data at once. So uh, on the left here, there's this data cube uh, with like latitude, longitude, time dimension. Uh, it's a big data set. You don't want to read all of it at once. You want to read subsets of it. So Xpatcher is one of those, um, it's a small library that allows you to do on the fly slicing. And you can slice it any way you like with whatever, uh, it works best with like multi-dimensional data that fits into an X-ray data model. So you can do the on the fly slicing, you don't need to save intermediate files. And then um, it does like the stacking for you into whatever shape you want, and then you fit it into the model. The alternative would be to write that for loop across all of your dimensions. And it's not maybe not too bad if you have just like x, y time dimensions. But once you get into multiple variables, it gets messy really fast. And you don't know like which index is which variable. So Xpatcher has, um, it uses, you can slice using names, like proper names. And it handles like date times. So those are some of the things you get for free with using the x-ray model. So uh, yeah, so it features like lazy loading, which saves a lot of memory. Uh, there's like convenience accessors, X-ray accessors, converting to TensorFlow or Torch tensors. And there's also an experimental cache mechanism on the main branch now of Xpatcher. So if you do want to save those intermediate output products to a cache, it's possible to do that. Um, so we'd like to maybe get some feedback on how that would work for your use cases. And on the roadmap, we also have um, ideas for implementing like shuffling, sampling, parallel async loading, that sort of thing. So that's um, the read the docs, expecture.read the docs. That's where you would find out more. So that's on um, slicing multi dimensional arrays. Uh, and to do all of this, uh, to chain all of these operations together, you could like write your own individual scripts. Uh, or you can use a library called Centrigio. So I've developed this library myself. Uh, it's like composable data pipes for geospatial data. Uh, basically, it implements a lot of I.O. readers for all sorts of geospatial data. So if you have data in the stacked catalog, you can use stack stack to feed it into an X-ray data set. If you have raster files like NetCDF, um, GeoTIFF, ZAR, you can use real X-ray to read it into an X-ray data set. Uh, vector file formats as well. You can read via PyOGR.io into a GeoPandas data frame. And from your GeoPandas data frame, if you want to rasterize it, I have a routine written with data shader to do that rasterization. Uh, once everything's in that X-ray format, you can then convert it into a PyTorch tensor. And also, if you have like other data sets you have, so you can do it yourself. Um, so if you have like point clouds, trajectory, movement data, text data, voice data, you can create your own data pipe as well. You're not stuck with what's here on this image. Uh, you can DIY your own custom stuff. So um, yeah, so do check out the docs. Uh, I've written some friendly walkthrough tutorials that walk you through examples like object detection, um, segmentation, all of those like different end-to-end -end examples. Uh, it's able to handle uh, multiple coordinate reference systems. So say you have a Sentinel-2 data set, 
that spans several UTM zones, it can handle that without projecting, reprojecting. It would just like read in the tensors itself. It can handle multiple resolutions. So for central central two again, you could have like you know ten meter, twenty meter, sixty meter bands. Usually people resample it to ten meter, but if you don't want to do that, you don't have to. There's a way to do that in Zentrio. Uh, you can bring your own custom functions. If you want to do a bit of pre-processing yourself, you just insert it there. And on the roadmap, I'm planning more stack data pipes, um, possibly decoupling this from PyTorch, because this is based on Torch data right now, and doing some fancy stuff to make this um, async first to make it even, even faster. Cool, and that's a lot. <laughs> I know that's a lot to digest. Uh, and I'm gonna also walk you through, not to just really briefly how the code looks like in Zentrio. So on the top, you would have uh, your a pointer to your ZAR file, the ERA5 ZAR file. Uh, you would be able to, for step two, read it using Kivik IO, using this XPy stack um, function. You could have, uh, there's a dot map function where you can select um, specific variables or do whatever pre-processing. You just write your own Python function and put it there. Uh, we can slice it with Xbatcher using name variables. Uh, and then we would, yeah, before feeding it into your neural network model, you would then have a function to convert like the QPy array to a torch tensor format. And then that da data pipe can then go into a data loader. So I have the code here, uh, if anyone's interested. And that, uh, quickly, the results, uh, it takes about 25% less time if you're using uh, the GPU-based Quick IO engine compared to the CPU-based ZAR engine to read data. Uh, if we do a bit of back of the envelope calculations, if we scale it to from 18 gigs to one terabyte, 2400 epochs, it takes about 24 hours a day to for the ZAR CPU-based engine and about 18 hours for the Quick IO GPU-based engine. So you're saving about six hours a day, multiply that by 30 for a month, you're saving about 100 hours a month, 180 hours a month. And for the, if you want to convince your CFOs or CEOs or your bosses, <laughs> uh, these are some of the numbers. Uh, they're again, back of the envelope, it will vary depending on what GPU you use. Uh, but you could save, I don't know, 900 New Zealand dollars a month, possibly with, with this. And for those of you interested in the carbon emissions, if you're running this on Sydney, which is, doesn't really have a good um, <laughs> uh, electricity, like carbon friendly electricity, but uh, these are some of the numbers if you're interested. And if you want to find out more, uh, check out the Project PTR cookbooks. They are really friendly, even if you're not into machinery, but if you just want to get acquainted with the Pangeo Python sort of ecosystem, those are good resources. Geosmart has a lot of discipline specific uh, ML discipline specific ML tutorials. Check that out if you're like researchers interested in certain machine learning algorithms. Uh, University of Washington has this Hack Quick as a service. They run they run a few. Uh, a lot of them are recorded on YouTube. And if you want to learn not with like a community of people, that's like a good guide as well. And for the Pangeo Machine Learning Working Group, we have meetings every first Tuesday of each month, 3 p.m. U.S. Eastern, that translates to about 8 a.m. New Zealand time uh, in the summer months. And if you're interested in speaking or like uh, showing some of the work you're doing, we're inviting people to join. And this is my last slide. Uh, check out the repo. Uh, the QR codes has links to the slides and all of the code, and yeah. Those are my GitHub, Mastodon, and you can also email me at wagey at developmentseed.org. But thank you. Thanks very much. Um, any questions for Wagey? I'll just state well, while questions are coming up, that all of these are being recorded, and uh, in about a week or so, they'll be made available on our YouTube channel. We'll get all the technology to get an email out. So down or take photos. Um, no, uh, just want to say, um, super cool talk and really great to see uh, the low level thinking that goes into it from people like you, so the rest of us don't have to. <laughs> uh, 
and yeah, I was really, really excited. So, um, as much as I'm an organizer, I didn't look at the program very well, and I saw like development seed. That's okay. cool. Like, you Thanks, guys yeah. make amazing stuff, uh, and a lot of it is way more accessible than the cool stuff you're working on. So go and check out what development seed does. Yeah. Thanks uh, for plugging our company. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, whereabouts are you actually based? I'm based in Wellington. All right. Actually, cool. uh, but I work remotely for for them. Yeah. Right. Uh, that was all. Any other questions? Any other topics? Thanks for that. I have a question. Uh, what if you don't want to do machine learning? Does Zen three Geo is it still relevant? If you just want to use the GPUs for faster computations or whatever. Yes, uh, to be honest, I cheated a little bit. I did not do any machine learning in this talk. <laughs> <laughs> everything is just everything up to the machine learning before you, the machine learning model, basically. So if you just want to use it for your GPU compute, you can do it. Uh, Zen Studio does have a bit of a dependency on PyTorch right now. Uh, but if you can live with that, yeah, go for it. <laughs> I'm trying to decouple it from PyTorch. That's one of the reasons why. <laughs> uh, one of the things that you mentioned early on was that um, your organization is really passionate about uh, moving stuff into the cloud as opposed to doing local processing. Uh, so with workloads like this that rely heavily on GPU, what does that sort of look like from a cloud perspective? Um, what components are you using to support that GPU processing? Yeah, so uh, a lot of the so the benchmarks I ran was actually on my local computer. I've actually had trouble with setting up GPU direct storage on the cloud providers I've tried, like Google Cloud, AWS. I know there's a way to set it up, but it's not. Uh, there's a lot of installation steps, and there's also some infrastructure stuff around the hardware. Like you need to make sure the wires are connected properly with like the PCIe switches and stuff. I think the NVIDIA, like NVIDIA has some good tutorials around that. It's just, um, but they're, you know, machine learning, like gen generic computer science focus for the geospatial community. That's not really something like that yet. And that's something I'm hoping to be able to like write guide guides on eventually. But yeah, keep, keep an eye on, <laughs> on this work. Right. Cool. Thank you again. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.